The secret to understanding the function and pain and tension of a, of a QL muscle is to realize that it doesn't work in isolation. It's a minor player in an overall system of breathing that is asymmetrical in nature. And behind any QL pain or tightness, tension, whatever you want to call it, is generally going to be a breathing dysfunction based off of the inherent asymmetry found within us uh, because it's part of a system, a larger system, including the psoas and the diaphragms. And those muscles, the psoas and the diaphragms, have to be playing their appropriate role before the QL can be relieved of the stress that it's under and causing you major difficulties. So obviously you have two QLs, one on the right and one on the left, and they can be painful, they both can be painful, uh, but they're generally painful for different reasons. And the reason is because of asymmetry. Now in the normal human predicament, we have a bigger right diaphragm that likes to pull us to the right. It likes to rotate our lower spine to the right. The way the brain works, it also likes us over to the right. Our visual system prefers the right side of the world. Our brain just pre prefers to pay attention to the right side of the world more than the left. That's just inherent human asymmetry. There's books written about that. It's just brain science. So when that's occurring, our pelvis will generally come forward on the left, back on the right, as we rotate to the right because the sacrum is going with it. So humans like to be over in this position, over on the right side, higher left shoulder, lower right shoulder. You see it all the time, uh, completely normal, not a big deal, until you can't get to your left side effectively because you stay on your right side too much. Then the left side starts to get a little bit weak. And now the pattern of right dominance becomes set more and more. So again, here's a typical situation a bigger right diaphragm pulling us over to the right, a right QL that's pulling the right ilium up and the right rib cage down, compressing things over on the right side, a left psoas that's assisting to rotate us over that lumbar spine and the pelvis over to the right, uh, and then a weakening of the muscles on the left. So the left QL, so the right QL is overactive holding you over on the right the left QL is just getting agitated. It can't really fulfill its role of fixing the rib, the 12th rib, the bottom rib in the correct position because that's what it's supposed to do. It helps fix the rib so that when you take a breath in, you can expand. But when you're stuck on the right, the left QL just can't do its job. It has no help over on the left side because you're never really on the left side. So whether the right QL or the left QL is your problem, both are remedied the same way. You have to get to your left side. You need exercises or techniques that get you to your left side and you learn how to use your left abdominals and your left hamstring. And you learn how to expand the rib cage over on the right and over on in the posterior portion of your left rib cage. Sounds complicated, I know, but the techniques that I show uh, all have this included. So those are the remedies, but it really comes down to the abdominals on the left. The internal obliques and the transverse abdominus have to get back into your life so they can keep your rib cage and your pelvis over on that left side uh, compressed or closer together so when you take a breath, you can do it without arching your back or using your neck. Because if you do that, it's just gonna pull you back to your right side. So that's the underlying game plan behind what needs to be done. So in the big picture, you have a left diaphragm that's working as a spinal stabilizer instead of as a breathing muscle. You need to get it working as a breathing muscle. The techniques that I show are intending to do that. The left QL is overworking as an inspiratory muscle because it can't really work. It's overworking and getting strained uh, because it can't really fulfill its duty. It's working as an inspiratory muscle, but it's not working as an inspiratory muscle in the right way. Let's just keep it. That's, that's the easiest explanation. It needs the left abdominals to help it out. It needs the left hamstring to help it out. It needs a pelvis to turn to the left to help it out. Again, the techniques that I show are all doing that one way or another. Uh, then the left psoas is overworking as a lumbar spine rotator to the right and external rotator of the left femur. So to shut it off, you need to uh, rotate your lumbar spine to the left and internally rotate your left leg and extend the left hip, which the, peer, which the techniques are also doing. Not as much hip extension as you'll see, but it is tipping the pelvis back on the left. So here are four techniques. They're all postural restoration techniques that can be used to start the process, to start the process, it's not a complete program, to start the process of relaxing overactivity of QLs. 
not again, not because the QLs just became overactive just for the heck of it. They become overactive and compromised because you lose function of the other muscles. Uh, they work too hard or they work too little. So the diaphragms and the psoas have to be doing their appropriate roles for the QLs to assume their appropriate roles as well. So I would do the techniques in the order that I'm showing them. So the first one is going to be a standing technique. It's called wall supported reach with IOs and TAs. Uh, you don't have to worry about the name, it is a, but it is a posture restoration technique. Uh, you're going to see, actually, let me just show you where we're trying to expand first. So in the back, you're going to look at, you're, you're looking at a picture of the 12th rib. It is at the 12th rib that the psoas, the QL, and the diaphragm all kind of converge. And on that left side in the back, because the left back gets overarched, the ribs in the back can get tight. They kind of come together. Uh, they need to expand so your body can shift to the left. If, you, if they stay tight, they're going to keep you over to the right side. So they need to expand. Uh, that will be, we're trying to do that through this technique that I'm going to show now, which is the standing technique. So before I show it, uh, two things. First, we're very much tilting the pelvis back. So you are working on, when, when your back is against the wall, you are posteriorly rotating your pelvis. So it's, fo it's probably forward at least on the left. It might be forward on the right side also. But either way, we have to tilt it back. So it's called pelvic inlet, the inlet uh, extension. It's being tilted back because it's stuck in a forward position, at least on the left side, which puts you over on your right side. So very important that you are able to posturally tilt your pelvis and keep, and keep your back flat against the wall, as you see in this picture. Now, from the front, you'll see that I have a ball squeezed between my knees. Now, here's important. You cannot use a foam roller. You cannot use a yoga block. It has to be something squeezable like a small ball. You don't want it weighted either. The ball shouldn't be weighted. Uh, you can use a roll of toilet paper. It works really well. Hugely important. I have sneakers on. Do not do this barefoot. I have made videos about why this is. No barefoot, no minimalist. Uh, my arms, oh, with and in regards to those feet, hugely important. Whenever your feet are on a surface doing a postural restoration technique, which are most techniques, you are sensing the heel of your left foot and the arch of your right foot. Heel of the left, arch of the right. Those, here's, if this was my right foot and the arch comes down, it pushes me left. That's pronation of the right foot that pushes me to the left as I'm making heel strike on the left. So those two areas are associated with, in your brain, with going over to your left side because that's the side that we're trying to get back into your life at this point in time. Because you need your right side also, but the right side can't do much if it doesn't have a left side to actually go to first. The right side gets its power from the left side. All right, you're just there. It doesn't mean it's working properly, but the left side has to be there for the right side to have any type of power uh, you know, contained within it. So left heel, right arch, squeezing the ball with my left knee more because I don't really want my right inner thigh that much. My hands are pushing down gently onto a chair, which helps me feel my abdominals. You don't want your six pack abs. It's more about the internal obliques to feel. You don't want to tighten up for your rectus through your six pack. And I'm just breathing in that position. So you're going you're to see a video. There's not much to see because I'm already expanded. I'm just breathing. But the one thing you don't want to do is when you take a breath in, you don't want to do this. If you do this, you're using your neck, and that's not going to work. So we're looking for rib cage expansion in that area that I just had mentioned, the, the 12th rib area, all the way up to the, to the eighth rib, which is we call the left posterior mediastinum. Uh, you breathe for about five breaths, in through your nose, out through your mouth. Get all the air out because you want your ribs to come down on the left. Pause, five, four, three, two, one, breathe in. And as I did that, because my ribs stayed down, as I did that, my back expanded backwards into my chair. And that's what you want to feel during this technique. So this is what it would look like. Again, there's not a whole lot to see. Now, I do have a towel between my upper thighs, uh, so don't worry about that. It can, I would just use the ball for this one. Um, there, again, not much to see. I'm just breathing into my back. I'm sensing my left heel, right arch. I'm squeezing. My hands are out in front of me. I'm in a flexed position because most people are in extension. As I breathe, my back moves back into the wall. As I'm staying over on my left heel, hugely, I'm going to keep focusing on that. Left heel, left heel, left heel. 
left abs, left abs, left abs, left abs, expand your left side, expand your left side, expand your left side. And if you can see my, my rib cage, my chest, my upper chest expand, that means my left lower back expanded also. I am not doing this. I am not doing that. That's hugely important. So you could do it five breaths, pause at the end of each exhalation. You could do it three or four sets of five breaths. And so that is technique number one, which is emphasizing flexion of the spine and trying to get your abdominals back into your life with your pelvis tilted back. Now, number two, uh, this is kind of similar. It's really the same position, except you're on your hands and knees, except instead of standing. So this one gets a little bit more because there's no wall behind your back on this one. Uh, it could allow for more expansion of that left rib cage. So I have a towel underneath my left knee. That towel is a little low. I make it a little bit higher because you want to feel that your left knee and your right knee, you want to feel it, not just know it. You want to feel that your left knee and your right knee are not resting on the same level. That, what does that do? Well, the knee underneath your left knee actually pushes your left pelvis back. It actually hip shifts you to the left for you, and it also turns your lower spine to the left. The towel does it so you don't have to actively do it. So people who, who have really overactive hip flexors or really overactive lower back muscles, they might try to do a hip shift, which you'll see later, and they might use their hip flexors or lower back to do it. So they, can't, they struggle to actively hip shift. Well, this does it passively for you. It's turning your pelvis and your lumbar spine to the left because of the towel. Then I'm pushing my right hand down a little bit into the, into the floor, which helps push me more over my left side. I'm feeling my weight through my left knee and my left hip, and I just breathe. Five breaths in, out, pause. Five, four, three, two, one, breathe in. And you're just trying to breathe into your back. You're trying to expand that same area, that 12th rib area on the left. And again, in this position, if your my head is over my fingers, because my weight is not too far back, my weight is forward a little bit, I feel my abdominals pretty easily in this. I didn't for a long time because of my, my neck and my cranium, but this is a good position for you to start to feel some left abdominal activity, which again is key. Left abdominals, left internal obliques is key to turning off a right QL and a left QL. Number three, I am sitting on my, you do not need to use a balloon. I'm sitting on my right hip. My left knee is pressing down into a towel. That makes, allows me to feel my left inner thigh. My left knee and my left hip are in a line with each other. As I exhale, I feel my left abs, and then I hold on to them as I take a breath in. So you want to, if you feel some left abdominal activity, and it shouldn't hurt, it sh because if, if, you feel, if you feel something over on your left side, and you're like, oh, it might be my rib cage, or it might be my back, or it might be my abs, if it feels uncomfortable, it's probably your back a little bit. Uh, you should just feel left abs working, and you try to hold your left inner thigh active and your left abs active, as you expand the right side of the rib cage, in order to shift, here's my left, you're like this over on your right, the right rib cage is, is closed down. In order to shift over to the left, these ribs on the right have to be expanded. And that's what you're doing right there. You're lengthening the right rib cage and you're, and you're breathing into it to help shift you over to your left side. And finally, uh, now that you've got some expansion into your rib cage, hopefully you felt some left abdominal activity in one of those positions. Then you have to start to also stabilize the pelvis from below using a hamstring. Uh, now, people can be in a lot of different situations. There's a lot of techniques in post restoration because some people need both hamstrings. Some people really only need their left hamstring. It depends on the pattern that they're in. Some people are really, really stretchy and they'll never feel their hamstrings for the life of them for the first, for quite some time. So I don't know what your situ situation is. However, you just kind of have to experiment and see what you feel. You should be able to feel anytime you put your feet on a wall and you're sensing your heels, you're pulling your heels down into the back of the shoe and you're wearing actual sneakers, not barefoot, and you're not you're wearing minimalist, something solid, and you pick your butt up and you squeeze and you pull down, you're in the easiest position you could be in to feel your hamstrings, okay? If you can't feel your hamstrings, there's something going on, which is gonna require help from someone who knows what they're doing. That's why this is pretty difficult stuff. There's a lot of possibilities. My whole YouTube channel is about this. So for me, I never felt my hamstrings appropriately because of what was going on in my cranium with my vision, my jaw, and my teeth. It was creating too much neck tension, too much back tension, 
those muscles, ha those muscle groups have to let go for you to, to be able to feel your hamstrings correctly. So if you do a technique like this and you don't feel anything remotely close to your hamstrings, you feel your quads, your calves, your back, your neck, or you feel just nothing at all, you're ungrounded. And why you're ungrounded could be a lot of different reasons. I can't tell you based off of, you know, I, unless I'm with somebody, there's no way to know. However, when you pick that butt up, and if you feel your hamstrings, particularly closer to your butt, it should be easier on the right side. But if you can feel both sides, well, you, you can make some progress on your own. You should, these techniques will help you. Uh, but if you're not feeling anything properly, it's best not to try to keep doing more and more stuff because you're just in a compromised state and you need someone who can actually physically help you in person. So what does this look like? Well, first you're gonna see just as I pick my butt up. So my feet are on the wall and I'm pulling my heels, I'm, I'm sensing my heels, they're pushing into the wall, they're pulling down, and then I pick my butt up a little bit. My belly stays relaxed. I do not want my, my uh, rectus belly to tighten up. And now here's just kind of a close up. I slowly pick my butt up off the floor and that's it, my back stays flat. And now here's what it looks like from the back. I squeeze the ball with my knees, I'm pulling down through my heels and I feel both of my hamstrings at this point. If you feel your right hamstring, then you wanna try, but not your left, then you wanna try with a hip shift and you'll see what the hip shift looks like after this. There it is, here I pick it up and I hip shift. So my right knee goes higher than my left. At this point, I'm gonna take my right foot off the wall and because my pelvis is turned to the left and my right foot is just coming towards me and then I'm tapping with my right big toe while my left heel is still pulling down, I feel my left hamstring. You're basically standing on your left leg. Your right leg is swinging through the air. You're in left stance, right swing phase of walking. You're just doing it lying on your back because you can't do it standing up yet because gravity will make you fall. Well, you won't fall, but you're gonna stabilize yourself inappropriately. So. If you can pick your butt up with two feet and both heels and you feel your right hamstring and your right inner thigh, you can probably, you can safely then do the hip shift and take your right foot off the wall and try to feel your left hamstring. If you pick up your butt and you're breathing, can't forget to breathe in through your nose, out through the mouth, same, same way of doing it. And you feel, you don't feel anything properly. I don't know if you want to continue doing it because you're just, your neck or your back or your hip flexors won't let go. It's not a hamstring issue at that point. It's not, a, it's not an issue of working harder. You don't have the opportunity to feel the hamstrings because something up top is not allowing them to be felt. So it's never a facilitation issue. You can't shut off the inappropriate activity that will then allow you to feel the appropriate muscles. And again, that's why this is complicated stuff. That's why I don't show a lot of techniques because most people can't do them and once they come to see me or any other PRI provider, they realize, oh, wow, no wonder. Like, this stuff is really, really hard. And it is. But it's all it's neurological based. You, know, you have to sense the right things. You have to be doing everything perfectly correctly. Otherwise, you'll use the wrong muscles. But done properly, and if you're in a situation where these techniques can work for you, they will start to help you reduce the inappropriate overactivity of QL muscles because you are addressing all the other muscles at the same time. The big ones, the psoas is being shut off, the diaphragm is starting to pump as a breathing muscle again, and you're starting to get your left hamstring and your left inner thigh back into your life to stabilize the pelvis so that the QLs can then start to relax.